Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Cruz, and I am an attorney in Seattle, Washington. I also own and operate a website called MMAPayout.com, which is an industry leader in the business and legal aspects of combat sports. I am very interested in the sport of mixed martial arts and actually written a book about uh, legal aspects of the sport. And in continuation with that interest, I am focusing on a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case, which uh, oral argument was heard in October, which looks at the legalities of in-sport torts. And so um, it's my uh, intention to write a law review article related to this. And uh, first and foremost, uh, one of the things that um, I wanna look at with respect to tort liability in the, ca in the cage and on the field is that, uh, is that there was a incident that occurred uh, last year on a Monday night football game between the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers and Cleveland Browns. Uh, toward the end of the game in which the Browns were winning, Miles Garrett uh, attempted to sack Mason Rudolph, a fight ensued and Garrett took off uh, Rudolph's helmet and attempted to use it as a weapon. Now, there was no, no lawsuit as, as a result of that. Um, fortunately, uh, Mason Rudolph was not injured um, uh, uh, permanent. He was not injured permanently as a result of that. And um, uh, apparently both sides um, made up this particular year. However, it brings up the case of on-field torts and whether an issue related to, uh, related to the tort of battery could have occurred here uh, with respect to Rudolph uh, suing, uh, suing Garrett. Now, currently, the UFC uh, is in uh, a um, lawsuit with Mark Hunt. Hunt was a heavyweight fighter um, contracted by the company, and he was going to fight a former WWE star, Brock Lesnar, in July of 2016. Lesnar uh, was an amateur wrestler in college, very good one, and he went to the professional wrestling uh, uh, right after college. He then uh, toiled in mixed martial arts uh, before going back again to professional wrestling. Well, in, two th in 2016, he wanted to return to the octagon, the cage um, which um, the UFC athletes fight in. And Dana White, who was the head of the promotion, he indicated that he would set him up with uh, Mark Hunt, who is an experienced uh, professional, uh, professional fighter. Hunt was concerned that Lesnar was doping, that he, uh, he was taking steroids. Uh, White assured him that Lesnar would be tested. The UFC implements a drug testing uh, program in which it randomly tests athletes to ensure that they don't have any, uh, any uh, foreign substances or any um, performance enhancing drugs uh, in their system and that that uh, that uh, testing is implemented by USADA. So the purpose of the paper is uh, to explore uh, in the sport of mixed martial arts where the primary goal is to make the opponent submit or knock the other out um, whether or not um, assumption of the risk can be used as this defense and what is the expectation of the participants that may be in a certain sport. Physical combat is expected from the participants in the UFC, but did Hansen sign a contract to fight an individual on performance enhancing drugs? Should there be a level of legal culpability on the part of the fighter and the promoter that puts on the fight? Or does the head of an organization have a personal level of legal liability? Now, what transpired um, in their fight on July 9th, 2016, was that uh, Lesnar resoundingly defeated Hunt. Um, it, 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 he won by unanimous, unanimous decision. There was no, no fouls or any kind of uh, disqualifications in, in the fight. Uh, Lesnar uh, controlled the fight the entire time and, and won handily. Uh, days after the fight, it was found that Lesnar tested positive for steroids. 
As a result, uh, in January of 2017, Mark Hunt sued the UFC, Dana White, and Brock Lesnar. Uh, the lawsuit was filed in the U.S. District Court in Nevada, and it, uh, it included an uh, assortment of, of causes, the violations of the civil RICO statute, breach of contract, breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair duty, fraud, and eventually battery. Uh, originally, the complaint indicated it was negligence, but in, in, in uh, the amended complaint, um, they had changed it to battery. Now, uh, the lawsuit, as you can see, uh, included a embedded picture of uh, Lesnar uh, pummeling Hunt, who, as you can see from the uh, PowerPoint, he is shriveled up. And the attorneys for Hunt uh, noted the, that Lesnar took uh, steroids to make himself bigger, faster, stronger. Uh, the court, however, dismissed the case on summary judgment in February of 2019 uh, in favor of Zufa, UFC, and Brock Lesnar, dismissing the, all, uh, all, uh, all the claims of Mark Hunt. Hunt still appeals to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the oral argument, as I indicated at the outset, took place in October 2020 before the three-judge panel. As of today, uh, which is Friday, February 12th, no ruling has been issued by the Ninth Circuit. Now, I wanted to note that the trial court, with respect to dismissing the battery claim, indicated a California Supreme Court case, Avila versus Citrus Community College District. Utilizing that case, they uh, used the rationale to dismiss uh, Lesnar's battery claims. Now, looking at the, the facts of that case, it was a, uh, a community college baseball game in which a pitcher beanballed uh, a batter. Beanball is, for those that don't follow baseball, is a pitch that is aimed at a batter's head. Now, fortunately, according to the facts, the, the uh, uh, player was wearing a helmet. However, he still suffered severe dam damages to his skull. He sued a uh, school district, um, but the California Supreme Court um, held that a pitcher uh, pitching a pin ball was in the realm of the game of baseball. And despite the injury sustained by the batter, the action did not give rise to a tort of battery. In the Hunt case, the trial court sided with Avila in determining that the injuries sustained by Hunt were similar to those in the sport of MMA. Further, Lesnar actions were not out of the ordinary when it comes to the sport of MMA, meaning that he did not use an illegal object or attempt to circumvent the combat rules and mixed martial art. Uh, if there was no drug test, you could, you, one might conclude that uh, Lesnar won fair and square. Well, the case goes to the Ninth Circuit Court of, Appe of Appeals. And there were issues brought up by the three-judge panel. The first uh, interesting issue was why wasn't Lesnar's test results received prior to his bout? He was last tested on June 22nd of, of, uh, of, the, of that year. The fight was July 9th. So there was all that time in between where there was no, no receipt of the test results. The test results actually didn't come until uh, after July 9th. So and the judge also noted that uh, when it was found that baseball players were found doping, there are significant consequences. And he asked both attorneys, or actually the attorneys for Hunt, uh, Zufa, and Brock Lesnar, uh, whether there's a corollary between intentional do torts and doping, meaning if someone is using performance enhancing drugs and commits a, a suspected tort, uh, is, is there a level of liability on the doping uh, athlete? And the question was asked because it's, it's uncertain. You know, um, I will bring up some cases um, here in the next couple of slides, which relate to torts uh, in the aspect of playing the games, but you will notice the, uh, the differences. 
also the judge asked, uh, why can't a fighter like Hunt ask for assurances that a fighter is clean of steroids, especially if the Fight Promotion Institute's a drug testing policy? Now, Zufa had made the assertion that they can control fighters. And even though there's a policy, an anti-doping policy, that fight, fighters could still circumvent th this, this particular policy. Hunt's attorney argued um, also that a beanball like in Avila could kill someone and an MMA fighter taking PEDs could kill someone as well. The, the whole uh, aspect of being bigger, faster, stronger can make the strikes much stronger um, and make you much faster, uh, kick much harder, things of that nature. So issues to consider here with this uh, with, with, with this case, uh, you know, what are the parameters in which legal liability and expectations of actions within the sport are important? In the incident involving Garrett and Rudolph, which I alluded to at the outset, you know, the swing of a helmet and striking of opponent does not seem foreseeable in, in football. Yet, and this is why I make the, 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 the uh, examples uh, distinct here. We have football where uh, there is hitting involved, but not uh, intentional strikes of other individuals uh, with, with hands and fists. Yet, compare that to uh, MMA where there is, uh, the rules say you have to uh, use hands and fists. And compare that to uh, the established law in Avila in which throwing it at an opponent's head with a baseball was considered a part of the game. So the Hunt case will consider the foreseeability of an athlete using performance enhancing drugs to harm an individual. Obviously, there are many variables to contemplate. Unlike football, basketball, or hockey, the specific intent in combat sports is to do physical harm to your opponent, like I, in, uh, I looked to before. Similar to some of the cases highlighted uh, with sport. In the UFC, uh, MMA, the company has a drug testing uh, policy to prevent those that seek an unfair advantage to win. So actually, let me back up here. It's the UFC that has this drug testing policy. There are other leagues and promotions that do not implement a drug testing policy. They rely mainly on commissions to adhere to those uh, drug tests. So the question of foreseeability as to whether an opponent could harm another with enhanced uh, uh, abilities is entirely contemplated in the sport of mixed martial arts. They, the fact that there are drug testing, uh, go, uh, drug tests going on in the, the sport of mixed martial arts, there is a potential contemplation that steroids could, uh, could have an effect on the sport. So other cases I uh, had done research on uh, with related to torts in, in the playing of sports. So Knight versus Jewett was a backyard uh, football, pickup football game during halftime of a Super Bowl by just neighbors. And uh, many of you may, might have heard that, uh, heard this case. Uh, a woman was injured and sued. Um, and the court indicated that she assumed the risk when she decided to play uh, the sport of football, even though there, uh, there was questions related to whether it was a touch football game or a, uh, a, a, a tackle football game. So Hackbird versus Cincinnati Bengals is similar to the incident that happened between Rudolph and Miles Garrett. So. Uh, during, uh, the during a football play, a cheap shot happened by a player on another when the uh, player that got injured uh, was, uh, turn had turned his head. So basically, uh, they found in favor of, uh, of the injured player who was cheap shotted. Then th there's the, uh, the famous punch. Rudy Tom Jonovich, who many of us know as the Houston Rockets head coach, uh, was hit in the face by Kermit Washington. Uh, Tom Jonovich sued because he rece received some really bad injuries uh, and a jury awarded him uh, a, a monetary amount. 
and they found a liability on the part of the Lakers franchise, as well as Washington, Kermit Washington. So the conclusions and findings here. Uh, I, I want to make a certain that the Hunt case is, is different than a lot of the in-sport tort cases that uh, have come uh, down the pike because we're dealing with an athlete that is taking PEDs to harm an opponent. And I believe that they should be found liable in the tort of battery, even if the harm is done within the sport. You find that in Ivanovich, they were playing the game when uh, the athlete uh, struck another athlete. And it was, it was found that uh, the, the athlete that was striking the other was li liable. Um, here is a little different uh, fact set because the purpose of the game is to actually strike one another. Uh, but I believe uh, the overarching policy of safeguarding athletes' health and safety override uh, a potential assumption of risk here. So it is controversial because in the case of team sports, proximity may not be known uh, of the harm caused. And it, but in individual sports, it would provide a level of assurance that a level playing field is devoid of stero steroids. And it also brings up the query of the state of mind of an athlete that uses PEDs. Are they being, are they trying to be bigger, faster, stronger, or are they actually, is there actually intent to hurt someone? Uh, you know, it, with the striking of, of an opponent. I do think that there is a policy uh, to protect athletes and athlete safety, as well as promote uh, not using illicit drugs. Now, it's not going to uh, it's not going to stop people from taking illicit drugs, but um, it will serve as a harbinger, uh, or, or as a um, as a deterrent uh, for athletes if they were to harm someone and uh, they could be sued for battery. So that's it for that uh, all I have. I thank you for all of uh, for Surla for, for inviting me to this. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, and I once again thank you for listening on for listening and having me participate in this conference.